Today's date is August 2nd, 2020. 2020. We're going to continue on finding the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're in chapter 7. Chapter 7 of the gospel according to John. Now, in this chapter 7, we're going to focus, we're focusing on just the gospel, so we're not going all over the place, but we are going to talk about the living water. Mm -hmm. The living water, that Christ is the living water. It's really going to be a cool thing because you're going to see it in the Old Testament and everything. But while we're doing this, we're going to go back several chapters to chapter 4, which we didn't cover before. Mm -mm. And we're going to talk about the lady at the Samaritan at the well and the living water there and how it fits perfectly with this chapter 7. So it's going to go hand in hand. So things are a little different. They're not really going on in chronological order necessarily. They're going on in the order of the gospel according to God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Okay, so what we find here in chapter 7 mm -hmm. is Jesus, his brothers are saying, hey, we're going to go to the Jewish festival of shelters, mm -hmm. which is the... Uh, festival of tabernacles. Tabernacles or tents or booths. Just a quick, quick background. There's three festivals held annually in ancient Israel. One is what we call the Passover, mm -hmm. okay, or uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, mm -hmm. okay, same thing. The other one is called Harvest or, you know, First Fruits, whatever, but it's a harvest. And the third one is this one. It's the Feast of Shelters or mm -hmm. Tabernacles. And this one is the last one of the year. That's right. <clears throat> and it's, um, this one is the most joyous occasion and party that they had all year. It's like a big camping world party. You get to camp outside and build these little booths, these little tents, mm -hmm. shelters. And it's, it's to remind Israel, not us Gentiles, we weren't there, part of this. But it's to remind Israel what God did for them when he took them out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they sheltered in the wilderness for 40 years. And uh, so remind them of that. So they're sleeping under the stars. They're camping. They've got palm branches and trees. And they're having a part. They're having a good time. They're eating food. They're having a good celebration. So actually the, the exodus is the Passover. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know where harvest would come. Well, it, it, here's, here's, yeah, it is the Passover mm -hmm. and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, they have the Passover. Then they have to eat the bread unleavened mm -hmm. for so many days. Um, I don't know where the harvest would in yeah, between that. I, I'm not that. sure. But then this would be the, the, the tents. Mm -hmm. It's the tents. Um, the harvest festival or first fruits is just basically you're, you're bringing to God the first fruits and celebrating that. But this particular one is just a big, big party. This one sounds fun. And it's a lot of celebration. They did a lot of jubilation, singing, horn blowing, crazy, crazy. And, um, but it started... With a Sabbath, right? No ordinary work to be done, none of that. Then they had like seven days of partying. And then on the eighth day, the last day of this festival was also a called Sabbath. It was a Sabbath, not the Sabbath, a Sabbath, where they did no ordinary work and things like that. And then on the eighth day was this huge celebration. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but this lays it all out, what you're about to hear. On this day, the priests, they're doing all this stuff throughout the whole week on the, you know, this festival and they're doing all this stuff and everybody's just having a good time. But on this day, they gather together and the priest goes down under the temple and under the temple runs a river that flows under the temple mount. Mm -hmm. And it's called the river uh, Shalawa. Shaloa. And in this way, this, this water that runs under the temple is like sacred, sacred mm -hmm. water, right? It mm -hmm. runs under the temple of God. So they would take a golden bowl and they would fill that bowl with this precious water that runs under the temple, Shaloa. 
And then they would come up among all the people. Everybody's like, yeah. And they would pour out the offering. They would pour out that water, that holy living water coming from the temple of God onto the altar of God as a sacrifice, as an altar. And then the people would go crazy, jubilation, horns blowing, cymbals clashing, choirs singing, dancing, party time, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what's going on on that last day. So we find Jesus and his brothers going to this festival of tents. The very last one in chapter 7. And he's going there, and his, his brothers go before him, and he says, hey, my time hasn't come yet, you know, um, but uh, I, I, not yet, but I'll, I, I'm not going to go yet, but I'll see you. Well, Jesus ends up going, and at the time, the Jewish leaders there, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, uh, we're still very upset with our Lord for his teaching and for his healing of the, the lame man on the Sabbath and things. And they wanted to kill him. Mm-hmm. So they were waiting for him to come to this festival so they could kill him. And they were even asking everybody, where is this rabbi? Where's he at? Where's he at? And of course, he didn't show up. But he did, but he was secretly there. Now, after... Several days had passed, probably the fifth, fourth or fifth day, because the Word of God says in the middle of the feast, Mm -hmm. Jesus then begins to teach at the festival. So he waits to almost the middle of it and begins to teach. And people are like, who is this guy? Where did he get his training? We didn't train him. Who is this? And he's just astounding him with his teaching. All right? Mm Mm-hmm. That's the backdrop. So about the middle of this festival, there he goes. And um, so we're going to go to verse, we're going to start with verse, we're going to skip all the rest of this stuff um, about Christ teaching there and him puzzling the Jewish leaders about what he said. And we're going to go to verse 37 because once again, what we're doing is concentrating on the gospel of God. Okay, the gospel of God in its purest form. And showing how there's nothing added to the gospel of God. There's no math. Mm-mm. And there's nothing subtracted. It is what it is. We've learned from chapter 6 and from the previous chapters that the Father wills, his, the God's will is for you to believe on his Son. You to believe on the one he sent. And that's Yeshua. His name means God is salvation. If you believe that Yeshua is God of salvation, you are accomplishing the work God wants you to do. Remember that in chapter 6? They were going, mm-hmm. we want to do the work of God. He says, here's the only work you need to do is believe in me. The that, yeah. There's nothing else in it. There's no water baptism. There's no church affiliation. There's no five points of Calvinism or five points of Arminianism. There's no... Uh, doctrine of election or predestination, preordination, and whatever. It says the ones that the Father sent to Christ. No one comes to Christ unless God draws him to Christ. Mm-hmm. Those that Christ have, and, th- and how do you know that you belong to Christ? Because you believe in him. Mm-hmm. You believe that he's the one sent from God for your salvation. Those ones that belong to Christ are always belonging to Christ. He says not one soul, not one person will be lost from that. And he will preserve that flock, the ones who know him, that Father gave him until the day of the resurrection or if you're still alive, a live resurrection called a rapture. That's the simple gospel of God. Nothing should be added to it or taken away. That's it. So here we have in verse 37, once you read... Uh, why don't you read down to uh, verse uh, 39, 37, 38, and 39. Okay. Verse 37. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare... 
Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. So it's the last day, and it's the climax of the festival. This is what I was talking about. It's day eight. Mm -hmm. The priests have gone down and got the living water from Shaloah, from under the temple. It flows under the temple mount. And they bring it up, and everybody's shouting about it, and they pour it out as a libation offering to God. And then here's Rabbi Yeshua. And, he, and it says, he stood up. He stood up. So he probably elevated himself on a pinnacle or something. He stood where everybody could see him. Now, he didn't do this. He didn't say, <coughs> excuse me, everybody, please listen up. <coughs> Is this on? Is this thing on? Excuse me, I have a few words to say. He, he doesn't say that. It says he stood up and shouted to the crowds. He cried out at the top of his lungs. So while the priests were pouring this, or after they had poured this living water, here's what he shouts out to everybody. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Mm -hmm. And here's the gospel of God. The gospel of God says that anyone who is thirsty may come to Christ. Now, if somebody's not thirsty for Christ, they don't come to Christ. Mm -mm. It's simple as that. The Father, you're not drawn to Christ. Because you're just, you're not interested in those kind of spiritual things. But if you're drawn to Christ and go, I want more of this living water, then you're drawn to him. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is drawn to him may come to Christ. And then he says, anyone who believes in me. So you come to him and go, I believe this is the one that the creator God sent down to reconcile me to him. To reconcile, to bind the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, right? To defeat to death. blind, to see. And to defeat death. Mm -hmm. We will be held by death. Anybody who believes in that, that Yeshua, that this, this rabbi here in the first century was that one sent by God, if he believes that, he may come and drink. And then he says, because the scriptures declare there's rivers of living water will flow from his heart. See, whereas the waters were flowing under the physical temple, the temple mount, the river Shaloa. He's saying these waters, the real waters, are going to flow from the heart. Later on, we read Paul says, you are the temple of God. So if we're the temple of God now, and the spirit indwells us, like in verse 39 here, it says, when he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered to his glory. When Jesus resurrected from the dead and sat on the right side of father, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus told his disciples. Exactly. Wait. It would be Terry the promise here. of the father. And not only for them, but everybody who believes. Who believes afterwards, including you and I and the Kapow listeners. So when that Holy Spirit now indwells the temple, we are the temple. We are the temple bound and the Holy Spirit in you. So inside of us is bubbling living waters will flow out from our hearts or from our bowels or from our very inner being, right? Um, it's not a feeling. Oh, I don't feel bubbly. Um, it's not that. It is because you have faith in Christ. The Spirit lives in you. You have that living water. And you never thirst again. See, you, you can't run out of that water and go, uh oh, I displeased God and I ran out of water. And now I got to get more. You, you, don't, you don't run out. It is always living water. Mm -hmm. So. And the proof is in the. Uh 
fruit of the spirit. That's right. In your life. That's right. Your character, your uh, your behavior will reflect that which is within your heart, right? So we get this this viewpoint that on verse 37, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stands up and says, anyone who's thirsty may come to me. What he's doing is he's saying, everything you guys have done since, since the law of Moses on these festivals, and this day when you're taking that living water from under the temple, physical water, and pouring it out unto God, that's pointed to me this whole time. I'm here. I am the real living water. Mm-hmm. I am the real thing. I am the real deal, That's is what right. he's saying. Um, let me read a little bit here, and then we'll go to chapter 4 and look at the Samaritan woman at the well, because he tells her the same thing about the living water. Mm-hmm. So you have the last day of the feast here. It's remarkable ceremonies, very joyous character. The, the priest is bringing forth in golden vessels waters from the stream of Shaloa. It flowed under the temple. And after the priest did this, they sung the words from Isaiah 12, 23. Mm-hmm. And in case you're wondering, I'm in the JFB right under verse 37, okay? If you want to follow me with that. I am. Okay. And then here's Isaiah 12. Uh, this is what they sang, uh, Isaiah 12. Three for five is what I'm looking at. With joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. In that wonderful day you will sing, thank the Lord, praise his name, tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how mighty he is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. And let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise with joy. For great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. Isn't that beautiful? Mm-hmm. It, it, it's very short. I mean, verse 1 is, in that day you will sing. I will sing you. I will, I will praise you, O Lord. You were angry with me, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. What does that mean? He was angry. We were appointed to wrath because of the fall. Mm -hmm. But it says, but no more. You comfort me. Okay? And then he says, see, God has come to save me. Yeshua's name means God is salvation. That's right. So he's, why they're singing this song (laughs) at the Feast of, of Tabernacles, our Lord stands up and declares I'm that guy that you're singing about. It says, see, God has come to save me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Victory over what? Death. Mm -hmm. Sin and death. Sin and death, yes. So he's standing up going, you are singing. You are spouring the water. Everything is pointing to me. I'm that prophecy fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Amen. And so anyway, so they sing this song with great joy as they get the waters of salvation. And thus, it's symbolical reference. (laughs) Excuse me. Mm -hmm. The symbolical reference of this act um, is pointing to the man standing up there screaming at him right now. Right. Mm-hmm. It says, um, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. It's an offer. What an offer. The deepest cravings of the human spirit are here. In the Old Testament, it's expressed as the figure of thirst and the eternal satisfaction of them by drinking. We're going to get to the woman of Samaria at the well in a little bit here. But he said almost the same thing to her back in John Chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. But she's, he, what he said to her and her, the Samaritans in private is now proclaimed publicly mm-hmm. in the temple, on the Temple Mount. This is the difference here. He, he comes and says, boom. Uh, 
So he um, he had already previously in chapter six, as we read, already announced himself as the bread and 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 the life and the, and, and the light. He's already announced that. And now he said, I'm the living water. It's it's just like Yahweh's, God's ancient proclamation. It's now sounding forth through human flesh. He says, hey, listen, oh, everyone that's thirsty, come. Come you to the waters, and he that hath no money, Isaiah goodbye. Isaiah 5.1 says... Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. That just reminds me of his teaching about, you know, don't worry about food. Yeah but about the eternal food that you're eating. And also, you see how this goes, too, with the, the, the Samaritan at the well. Mm-hmm. When the disciples came back and said, eat, Rabbi, you know, because he went and got bread, and he goes, you have food. I have food you know nothing of. Mm-hmm. And it's also what he said to her. She was like, uh, yeah, give me some of this water so I don't have to come to this well anymore like that. And he's talking. So it's, everything was pointing to him. And it's amazing because he was... Pointing to her sin, you know, when he says, bring your husband. Mm-hmm. And she confessed that she didn't have a husband, but she's had many. And he says, You're, you said correctly because, um, yeah, you did have many men. And the one that you have now is not your husband. Yeah. And then she goes, oh, you must have been, you must be the prophet. And mm-hmm. So she had to repent. Mm-hmm. And then she came and got the living water. And got the living water. She came. She was thirsty. I want to know more. And she went back to everybody else. And they believed. The one thing that's amazing about that particular incident, there was no miracles performed there. He didn't heal anybody. He didn't cast out any demons or anything. He just stayed with them for two days. And they just believed what he said. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Whereas the Jews always wanted a, um, a sign. But the Samaritans, the half Gentile, half Jews, believed what he said. So you read this Isaiah 51, uh, 1, and then, you know, why spend your money on food that's not give you strength and stuff? And you're right. It's just like his teachings about don't get all wrapped up in the things of the world. Don't get all crazy about it. There's there's something better. At verse 3 of this, uh, Isaiah 53, 55, mm. it says, Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. And then I will make an everlasting covenant with you. That's his... That's the new covenant in his blood. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen, open up your ears. He says, I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. And then he talks about David. And then here's our Messiah that looks like the same thing. You know? Mm-hmm. Pretty amazing stuff. And you know what's interesting about I will give you the, all the unfailing love I promised to David? Well, David's name is Beloved. <coughs> Which harkens to Christ, who is God's beloved son. Beloved son. It's all time. So at all point, David David was a type of Christ and mm-hmm. pointed to him. Everything that was written points to this rabbi in the first century standing there going, I'm him. I'm that guy. And of course, 2,000 years later, we believe without even seeing. We believe without even seeing him screaming on the pinnacle of the temple. We just believe because God drew, drew us to him. And that's salvation. and mm-hmm. That's undescribable. Um, now, this is interesting. In verse 38 of, of John 7, verse 38, uh, anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water shall flow from his heart. And these words belong to what follows. You know, out of his belly is, a, is the King James Version. Out of his belly shall flow, right? Out of his heart, out of his innermost being. And we know later where Paul writes that we are the temple of God. And don't you know that the Holy Spirit indwells the temple of God, right? So that's the living water. But it says, when he said, don't the scriptures say this, it doesn't refer to any particular passage but a bunch of passages. So you might want to read this. This is Isaiah 58, 11. Do you have that? 
I'm at uh, I'm at verse 38 in the JFB. Well, you find it, I can read it. Yeah, you read. Oh, here it is. And did you say 5811? Yeah, it's the first one, yeah. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the des deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. Yeah. Uh, how about Joel 3.18? In that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk. Water will fill the stream beds of Judah and a fountain will burst forth from the Lord's temple, watering the arid valley of Acacias. It's like Jesus was standing there saying, right now, I am the temple. Mm -hmm. In fact, he referred to himself later on. And he says, go give us a sign. And he says, here's the sign you're going to get. Destroy, I, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Mm -hmm. Clearly he was referring to his self, his own his body, body as the temple. So here he is quoting these scriptures or saying, here's what the scriptures say. He's clearly saying, I am the temple and I have the living water. <laughs> so if they had ears to hear, eyes to see, any of these scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees that understood the law and understood the scriptures should have seen these, these huge connections mm -hmm. that are just irrefutable connections of, of who he is and his deity. Um, how about Zechariah 14.8? On that day, life-giving waters will flow out from Jerusalem half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. Now, when I read that, it doesn't give a lot of detail, but Ezekiel does. But when I first read that, I thought, hmm, mm -hmm. living water out of Jerusalem, okay, this is Christ, but half of it's going um, to, the, to Dead the Dead Sea and half towards the Mediterranean. The, the first thing that came to me, and I, and I didn't know this for sure, but the first thing that came to me was like, well, the Mediterranean would represent Israel, right? Those who understood this stuff, those who, the early church who understood this. And the Dead Sea would represent the Gentiles because we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead to God. We, we had eternal death before he reconciled us. And so to me, it seemed like the difference between the early Christian church in Jerusalem, the, the Jewish church, and the Gentiles. And then I got confirmed when I read Ezekiel 47.1. What says, In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. You keep reading. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There, I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time, the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to cross or to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the riverbank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. And we'll keep, we'll keep reading, but right there, verse 8. This river that flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. Remember, it was flowing from the temple. And there's trees now and everything he sees it. And he was taken the depths of it says, the waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. Mm -hmm. The Gentiles you know, the are restored. Too, 
in seven when it says, when I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing both sides of the river. And I'm thinking about, you know, the Proverbs. Is it Proverbs or Psalms? Where it says the tree of life, or not the tree of life, but yes. the trees. And we're like so, um, the symbolic um, symbol of the trees, yeah. where our roots go deep into the water, yes. the living water of God. Yes. And we grow and grow fruit, and it doesn't matter how hot it gets, but we just continually have green leaves. and. Yeah, the wind so- blows and the heat blows, but it's like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah, life it it flows. It makes it fresh and pure. Look at verse nine. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever the water flows. This is Christ nourishing us, mm-hmm. bringing us to life. Ten. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea, all the way from En Gedi to En Eglaim. The shores will be covered with gnats drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea, just as they fill the Mediterranean. Yeah. We'll stop there. But just verse 11 says, but the marshes and swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Mm-hmm. All these water references, so getting back to John, getting back to Yeshua standing in the temple, standing up, shouting these things and, and saying the scriptures say uh, living water will flow out from in there. So there's a whole bunch to back it up. Um, so the idea is that uh, the most of the idea is that water is issuing from beneath the temple to which our Lord compares himself and those who believe in him. Coming out of the belly, you know, rivers of living water. It's the um, it's the amount of of water. It's the quality of water. Mm. Okay, so we know that he spoke this saying uh, when the Spirit comes, and the Spirit had not yet uh, came because he hadn't been crucified and resurrected yet. But on that day of Pentecost, it did and. Wham! All right. Mm-hmm. So let's. While we're talking about living water, let's go back to chapter four. Do you have anything else to add on that? Mm-mm. Let's go back to chapter four if we can. And yeah, take a little time machine. I have to do it manually. All right there we go. 30. Chapter four, is verse thirty-nine. 39. Yeah. We'll start there. Okay. Oh. Actually, we'll go up. Let's go. Let's go up where it first starts. About, uh, oh, first one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we've got all these wonderful notes. Okay. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near their field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily wearily beside the well about noontime. (coughs) Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, And Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, You would ask me, and I would give you living water. There it is right there. Living water, the gospel of God. Mm -hmm. You you would be drawn to me and ask me, and I would give you eternal life. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? 
And Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. There's the gospel of God. But those who drink the water I give, so you're drawn to Christ, you accept him as Messiah, he's the one sent from God, will never be thirsty again. Uh, uh, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, just like the the uh, the rivers of Shiloh under the temple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Verse Please, 15. Sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. And then Jesus told her, go and get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the one, to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Wow. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerson, where our ancestors worshipped? And Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, a time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You know why? Because we become the temple of God and the Holy Spirit, that living water, indwells us. So it don't matter if you're in Jerusalem or Mount Gerzum. You're going to worship God in spirit. And in truth. And in truth. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Well, we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, who, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And you can see now why, because God is a spirit, so he has to regenerate our dead spirit yes in order to communicate with him yeah dang that's good absolutely we have to become new creatures he regenerates us it's a regeneration we actually become a new creature Mm -hmm. to reconcile when uh, in verse 22 he's talking about the samaritans and this is um and christ says you samaritans know very little about the one you worship Mm -hmm. there's a note there you should have a note there in verse 22, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's the gospel of God comes through a specific channel. For salvation is of the, the Jews. Jews. In, intimating to the her that salvation was not a thing left to be reached by anyone who might vaguely desire it of a God of mercy, but something that had been revealed, prepared, deposited, with a particular people, mm-hmm. it must be sought in connection with and in issuing from them and that people, the Jews. And that's why, you know, sometimes you'll hear this heresy, <coughs> pardon me, you'll hear this heresy about, we heard it the other day, some, some moron was saying, you don't need the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. You don't need the commands of God. Get rid of the Ten Commandments, all like that. All you need is the New Testament. And that's a, it's heretical. If you don't understand the roots where we came from, you won't understand anything. That's why Re- the book of Revelation, most people don't can't even grasp it because they don't understand the roots from where it comes from, mm-hmm. the Jewish roots. There's a very specific way that God chose to reveal himself and to reconcile people to himself. And that was through the Jews. The seed, our Messiah, came through the Jews. Mm-hmm. So the gospel, this is important, can't be obtained through other religions or belief system. It must come from the Jews. So you can't say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I believe in the the uh, Buddhist Jesus. I take the Buddhist path to Jesus or the Hindu path to Jesus or the Mormon path to Jesus mm-hmm. or the you know Jehovah's Witness path to Jesus or wh- whatever. You can't, you, you, you can only come, the, the truth came to the Jews. Mm-hmm. It's very specific. And the reason is, is you can't, you just can't think any willy nilly thing. Mm-hmm. It's Yeshua, Hamashiach, from Nazareth, that was a Jew, that came out of the Jewish tradition and culture, born full man and full God, the Son of God, 
that was sacrificed, his blood, that, that precious blood of deity was sacrificed for our sins and he resurrected and defeated death. And now he sits on the right hand, Father, and the Holy Spirit has been given to us and we are preserved until the day of resurrection or live rapture. Amen? Amen. Verse 23 has another note. <clears throat> but the time is coming indeed. <clears throat> it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. Okay, and so the note says, born of the Spirit, the gospel of God is to be, to be born of the Spirit. This is that living water inside. Wow. Eternal salvation. <clears throat> there's no ritual. There's no ordinance. There's no works. There's no law. Only the Spirit regenerating the lost soul. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And there are works. Amen. Amen. So let's read on. Verse 25. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. And um, it says the gospel of God is accessed only through the Messiah. This is how it works, why it works, when it works, and this is what the gospel is. Only through Christ. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, <laughs> what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So, so people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Start back there. Doesn't that remind you of those scriptures we yeah. read in Isaiah? It's, why are you worried about food, buying the food that perishable, stuff like that? I give you eternal bread. I give you eternal water, eternal life. It's that eternal mind that makes a difference on how you deal with this prison planet, this matrix we live in, and how you become overcomers. Mm -hmm. You either overcame or you overcome. Yeah, and I, I believe that this was also the teaching that God gave, that Jesus gave to the multitude after yes. he fed them. Yes, you know? it is. You follow it, me because of the food I give you. Yes. But don't work for that food that perishes but for the food that is eternal. You're absolutely right. And we, we did this uh, in chapter six. Mm -hmm. But when we talked about the feeding of the 5,000, you're absolutely right. That is the message. He did the miracle in order to point, I am that bread. You remember when he gathered up the 12 baskets, I mean, 12 baskets of, of scraps of leftovers so that none is wasted. You know, I am that bread. Mm -hmm. Verse 33. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. And then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. And the note there says, In Psalm 40, 6 through 8, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Amen. Then Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou was not, wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Mm. That's so beautiful. It is, isn't it? My nurse comes from doing the will of God who sent me and finishing his work. There is everything. But God had points. prepared a body for him. Mm -hmm. To God do that. flesh. Yeah. It's right there. The deeper you get, the more layers of the onion you appeal. The, the gospel of God for us, the, the receiving of the gospel, is simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the one that the Father sent to reconcile you to him. It's that simple. Nothing added to it. But the gospel itself, the, the inner workings of it, is complex God. 
how how he made it work is incredible. What he did, how he did it is incredible. For us, it's a decision. For us, it's a, I believe this is the Messiah. This is the one I want to follow. I want to be baptized in Christ and move forward. But the, the nuts and bolts behind it, the workings behind it, the machinery behind it, unbelievable how everything points to this. Crazy. 35. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is brought is people, people. brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, harvests, and it's true. You know, maybe that's the, where the um, first first fruits came almost uh, oh, yeah. when they walked through the water and came up. Or it could be after the first group d- passed away and the other mm-hmm. ones... The children went and got the promised land. Mm-hmm. That could be that is something to look into because yeah. we got the Passover and mm-hmm. we got the tents in the wilderness. Where's that that second? Um, yeah, because it seemed you know, like okay, the the, old, the the original had to die. Yeah, and then from them came the second came the harvest. Yeah. of their offspring. Yeah, and they're the uh, ones that went into. Uh, the yeah, that makes that makes the most sense. Out of, I'm, I'm just, yeah, but that's evolved. good. That's be something to kind of look into. It's another study, but it's something to look into on our personal notes. You know the saying: one plants, another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said. He told me everything I did. Mm. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed two days, long enough for many to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. And it says we, we hear by faith. Faith well, by hearing the word of God. This is the gospel of God. Purest form gospel of God. He stayed for two days, long enough for many to hear his message and believe. Mm-hmm. His message was, I am sent from the Father for the remission of sins, to to pay the price. I am he, and they believed it. Um, this is not now we believe, not because just what you said, but we heard it ourselves. He's the savior of the world. Romans ten seventeen says, So faith comes by hearing, and that is hearing the good news about Christ. Mm, perfect. I have a note here that says, Unsought he had come to his own, yet his own received him not. Mm. Now those who were not his own had come to him, been won by him, and invited him to their town that others might share with them in the benefit of his wonderful ministry. Here then would the solace of his already wounded spirit and have in this outfield village triumphed of his grace, a sublime foretaste of the bringing of the whole Gentile world into the church. Wow. And that's it. We end at verse 42. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hope for those listening, this uh, was pretty clear. The simple gospel of God, um, not preached much anymore, unfortunately. But that's how you come to salvation. That's how you keep salvation. Mm -hmm. You don't. Father does. Uh, We we saw in chapter 6 that those who the Father sends to Christ, he loses not one soul, not one and the, the promise is, I will raise them up on the last day. It's that simple. We, as humans, have complicated the heck out of everything. The Gentiles have, in fact, trampled Jerusalem until the day or the age of the Gentiles is over. And that's what we're seeing today around the world, the ending of the age of Gentiles. 
And when Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, this is all going to go. But that's where we're at today. They trample the things of God. It's, it's trampling, like, like swine trample anything. We've lost the original. We were never original Jews. Even if there's Messianic Jews out there, you're not original Jew, pal. You don't know any, you know, you know less than I do. I, just because you were born a certain ethnic mm-hmm. Jew and you might wear a hamaka with zoom zooms, you don't know anything. Um, the original church did. Those Jews came out of Judaism. They knew the scriptures. They were raised in that environment. Uh, We're Gentiles, and we're trampling the things of God in Jerusalem until the Gentiles end. But the good news is you're saved if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be kept until that day of um, redemption when he comes. Mm -hmm. All right? Anything else? Well, um, I was just thinking about... um the Apostle Paul, he says, you know, the only thing that really matters is that um, you have the Holy Spirit. Because mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit, if you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, mm-hmm. that's all that matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all that matters. And you get the Holy Spirit when you come to Christ. He then indwells you with his Spirit. So this is different than the day of Pentecost when they were baptized. They were baptized with the Spirit... For, for power and witnessing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a gift. There's gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gift of tongues. Um, glossolalia. It doesn't have to be a, a, a natural language. It was in the second chapter of Acts. They all heard their own language praising God. But in the church setting, the second Corinthians, glossolalia is an angelic language that should be interpreted for the benefit of the body. If it's not interpreted for the benefit of the body, there's no sense in getting into glossolalia. In your own private prayer language, you can, especially if you can also interpret it before the Lord or have somebody close to you can interpret the Lord. But the gift of tongues is a gift of the Spirit. That's right. There's a lot of gifts of the Spirit. There's mm-hmm. gifts of administration, gifts of teaching, gifts of, of, of grace, of giving. Uh, there's mercy. A, mercy. There's a lot of gifts. And many, many gifts, one spirit. What you get when you come to Christ is the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Mm -hmm. These are different than spiritual gifts. Each man, each person gets a spiritual gift. Some have multiple, but a spiritual gift. They're always to be used for the building up and edifying of the church, the body of Christ. Right now you're listening to Ms. Kapow and I. We're using our gift of teaching and breaking down the word of God for what? For your benefit, to uplift. and That's the gift of the Spirit being used for your benefit. It's never for our benefit. It's never for money. It's never for gain. It's for, it's for you, for the body. If um, we need healing, it, it would be nice to go to a church to have someone that operated in a real genuine gift of healing from the Holy Spirit to lay hands on you and pray for your healing. That's a real thing. It hasn't ceased. Mm-mm. Um, I, I, I know the Calvinists <laughs> like to say it ceased. I feel sorry for them because they, they're the frozen chosen. They have so many things right, but that they have wrong. And so their churches are dead and powerless, and they can't help anybody. Mm-hmm. They, can't, they can't do you any good. Uh, they could teach you the word intellectually, but they have no power to help you. Uh, same thing with somebody with a prophetic gift. If, if, you, if you need a prophet in your life, there's nothing better than someone who speaks on behalf of God into your life. I'm talking the real gift of the Spirit, not clowns, Mm-mm. the real gift. Somebody who actually has those gifts never brag about it. They don't call themselves prophet. They don't call themselves apostles. They don't hang a shingle on YouTube. They just operate in the gifts of the Spirit whenever the Spirit comes upon them for the edification of other members of the body, mm-hmm. period. And the thing is, um, people with those gifts can't do it on their own. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-mm. I mean, you could have the gift of faith and the gift of healing, but it's still the Holy Spirit that does the, the work. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's not a Benny Hinn healing show or nothing like that. He doesn't operate with the gift of the Spirit. He operates in a gift of eh, Kundalini and the spirit of demons. Seriously, uh, no one's getting healed at his deal. And it's not glorifying Christ and it doesn't edify the body. People go to Benny Hinn show 
for the miracle. They're hoping to get healed. They're not going there to see the real Jesus Christ. Um, so yeah, there's a big difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit that you get upon conversion. Mm -hmm. A lot of Calvinists and, the, and Baptists and stuff don't, don't see, they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. um, that's because um, well, they're not reading the word properly or discerning the word of God. And that's what they're taught. Yeah, and they're taught, and they repeat their own nonsense. Uh, well, they worship John Calvin rather than our Lord Jesus Christ, or they worship the Apostle Paul and his teachings rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with Paul. Paul said it right. We misinterpret Paul a lot because he was a heavy dude. Mm -hmm. um, but the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's a simple gospel. We do have gifts of the Spirit, and they're, they're, there's many of them, many of them. I... I joke around and call myself a dream weaver. I do. I do operate in a gift when the Spirit gives to me of interpreting dreams. Many, many people. Many. Miss Kapow can attest. How many? I mean, a lot. A lot of people have come to me. They find this out, and they go, "I had this weird dream." I'm not talking. You ate too many tacos that night. Don't don't you start sending me taco dreams. I don't have time for taco dreams, and I know the difference. But some people have dreams that are very disturbing. They know it's prominent. There's something going on in their life or something. I'm not talking dreams about, you know, what's God going to do with COVID? What's it? I'm not talking about that nonsense. I'm talking about personal dreams that are usually on a personal level, something going on in your life. And people will send me these dreams. And I always, always tell them, let me pray on this and seek the Lord and I'll get back to you. Because I cannot interpret the dream. Mm -hmm. on my own. When the Spirit of God allows me to interpret it, I'll be reading it and all of a sudden I'll just bam, snot, snap. Just like da Daniel. Just like Daniel. He says, only God's the interpreter of dreams. Joseph said the same thing mm -hmm. to the to the uh, cupbearer because uh, they were very disturbed. The cupbearer and the baker were very disturbed about the dreams they had. And Joseph tells them, only God can interpret these things. Now tell me your dream. In other words, only God can do it. Now you tell me your dream because God's given me that gift. Joseph knew he had that gift. So that's what I do. I pray about it first. And when I pray about it, God will give me the thing. And there's no guesswork in it. I say, you saw this, you were doing this. This means you're struggling here. This, this, and this, and this. Blah, blah. Or I'll just tell people straight out, and I've told them out, this is not from God. This is a deceptive dream to lead you down the wrong path dismiss it and get rid of it. I've done that several times. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also been times that I prayed about it and I get nothing. Mm -hmm. Squat. So either I don't have the proper information or it's a taco dream that they had or just God didn't give me the interpretation. I say all this to say that it's a real gift. Uh, but I don't I don't do it. And, oh, and I also can't interpret my own dreams. I can mm -hmm. only do others. <clears throat> I'm saying I have that gift, but I don't have it all the time. I have to pray and get it. You know, uh, Miss Kapow has a gift of, of kindness and mercy, the law of kindness. She will see things that I will never see. I can be eating at a restaurant or in Walmart or something like that, and she'll just take off. Miss Kapow will just take off, and I'm looking up, what are you doing? And she's running to the door to hold it open for some little, little old lady in a walker. And I'm like, how did you see that little old lady walking up? It's because I saw her get out of the car and struggling, and, and she will run and open the door. You might say, well, that's just nice. It's not just nice. That was shown to her by the Spirit to help that little old lady. To sh it's a called the law of kindness. Ms. Kapow used to pray, Lord. Yeah, um, let the law of uh, kindness rule my heart. She used to pray that all the time. Lord, let the law of kindness rule my heart. It does. It comes out. And I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, that's just one example. Uh, she might go, oh, I'll be right back. Where are you going? I'm going to drop off this painted rock on my neighbor's yard. <clears throat> Why? Because she's done so much, and it's just something to cheer her up. A little, little painted rock I painted for. Stuff like that. Stuff I would never notice or do, because I don't have that kind of gift. I have a gift of yelling at you. <laughs> <laughs> and slapping you across the face, telling you you're stupid, that you don't believe the biblical word. That's my gift. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, I have the gift of chopping off the heads. <laughs> but, you know, there's a law of kindness there. Um, you too, if you're, li you're listening, 
as a believer, you have a gift. You have a gift. You don't need to seek God. What's my spiritual gifts? You don't need to read stupid books or watch YouTube. All you have to do is yield to the Spirit. Yield to what the Spirit's telling you to do. You might have a gift of discernment. Um, you can just talk to people and discern the Spirit. You can discern what they're saying. There's something wrong there. You may not know what's wrong, but you can discern that there is. You may have a gift of teaching. You may have a gift of administration. Um, hospitality. Hospitality. You just uh, <clears throat> you love people and bring them in. You, you just, there's all, there's one spirit, many, many gifts. But here's the key. They're all designed to edify and uplift other believers in Christ, what we call the body of Christ or the church. Not a physical church. Your mom, your sister, your, your brothers, your, your, that's what it's designed to do. Never to draw glory to yourself and you don't make money off these things. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of Satan. Right? And I don't know how I got there or how we got there from mm -hmm. living water. But I'm trying to say the difference between this, the Holy but Spirit. But that is the living water. It is the That's living water. That's the uh, demonstration of God's living water living in you. Yeah. Operating in you. That's why. Right? That's so now right. I shall say, ciao, babies. <laughs>